On behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, welcome back to JLF's Brave New World Season Two. A magazine partner for this series is the Week Journalism with a Human Touch. Our first session of the day is two menus: poetry and fiction. Rachel De Waskin in conversation with Ranjit Haskote. The session is presented in partnership with the University of Chicago and the University of Chicago Center in Delhi. Author Rachel De Waskin's work draws heavily from the ideas of identity, culture, and the self, exploring the peripheries and transnational experiences of humans across linguistic and physical boundaries. De Waskin's latest works include the novel. Banshee and the poetry collection Two Menus. In conversation with poet Ranjit Haskote, she discusses her writing journey, exploring the landscapes of poetics and essence of narratives. Rachel De Waskin is the award-winning author of five novels: Someday We Will Fly, Banshee, Blind, Big Girl Small, Repeat After Me, and the memoir Foreign Babes in Beijing. De Waskin's poetry collection Two Menus. was published in 2020 she is an associate professor of practice in the arts at u chicago and affiliated faculty in jewish and east asian studies she joins us today from chicago with this wonderful backdrop which you'll see of the field museum speaking with her is ranjit hoskote a poet cultural theorist and curator his sixth collection the poetry including vanishing acts central time and jonawale His translation of a celebrated 14th century Kashmiri woman's saint's poetry has appeared as I Lala, the poems of Lal Deed. All our sessions, as you know, have been broadcast and are available on our Facebook page JLF Lit Fest and on our YouTube channel Jaipur Lit Fest JLF. Please do remember to ask questions and comments by typing it into the comment section below, and Ranjit will ask these off. Uh, Rachel, at the end of the session, in case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our Facebook and YouTube channels. Literature inspires and empowers. Please do help Teamwork Arts continue to bring you JLF's Brave New World. Buy YouTube super chat and super stickers now, ladies and gentlemen. Two menus: poetry and fiction. Rachel De Waskin in conversation with Ranjit Haskote. Rachel Ranjit over to you. Sanjoy thank you so much. It's uh, really a pleasure to be uh, to be here with you. I'm going to say this evening for Rachel it's her morning of course. And uh, Rachel well, welcome to this uh, to this conversation. I've had uh, uh, a really a marvelous time reading your work both your fiction and your poetry. And um, I thought I might begin by drawing you out really on uh, biographical questions that you've probably fielded many many times but it came to me as I was reading your work that uh, there's a certain analogy with a long ago american novelist who people probably don't even remember any longer pearl buck I find uh, uh completely different kinds of writing but what I find uh, profoundly engaging is the way in which you've connected with uh another culture another society uh part of this stems from your own background your father's a sinologist you were born in japan and yet in a world where differences have moved to the point of 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 being polarized to a lethal level you've uh, do excuse the train sounds in the background <laughs> i like i like the train <laughs> <laughs> kind of adds to the texture. So my first question to you really would be would be this. You've lived, you spent your 20s in in Beijing. You've engaged closely with China. Uh could you speak a little to the way in which translation for you is not a practice additional to your writing. It's fundamental to how you approach the world as a writer. Of course, I would love to to talk with you about that. I first of all, thank you for having me and thank you for the lovely introduction and the deeply thoughtful question. Um I've also admired uh, your collection, your most recent collection, Atlas of Lost Beliefs, enormously. I find it so interesting and I think 
in a funny way, our work has a lot of uh, resonance. So I'm glad to be talking with you. Um, and I'd be curious about your answer also to this question. So for me, most of my imagination has been shaped by my engagement and my family's engagement with other places and with people who are not me and people whose ideas are not mine and people's, who, people whose perspectives differ vastly from mine and whose language and sort of cultural values are not the ones with which I'm most familiar. And China is, is central to that for me because I traveled there as a child. I spent my, my summerhood, my, my childhood summers, you know, traveling across dusty rural Chinese villages by train with my parents who are quite adventurous, both teachers. Um, and I remember when I was 10, we visited Lashan, the giant Buddha, this massive Buddha carved into a cliff wall. I think it's like 247 feet tall or something. And I was this, you know, anemic, skinny, <laughs> brooding little kid. And I remember thinking it was literally the biggest thing I had ever seen. You could kind of climb down the Buddha and into this kind of netted railing over swirling waters. It was quite dangerous actually, China not being litigious. Um, and then back at the top in the parking lot, there were these guys called micro carvers and they were carving Chinese characters on single strands of human hair. And they had these massive microscopes so you could look and see that they had carved your name. And I just remember even as a little kid thinking <clears throat> that China literally held for me the possibilities simultaneously for what was biggest and what was smallest. And it gave me in that way, a sense of myself in the world and a, a very distinct and for me revelatory idea that my American life was not central to the world's working. I remember imagining my house, my parents' lovely house in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where they teach as being a tiny little green monopoly house, like a board game piece because I was so far away from it. And because there were so many people for whom it didn't exist. And I think for Americans in particular, I mean, for everyone, but, but for Americans in particular, that idea, the idea that other people's views of the world take up as much space as, as ours do, in some cases, more space is, ma is meaningful. And my work really comes out of that idea and the experience of sort of seeing myself not as a default person and not even as a protagonist but as somebody sort of on the periphery looking in. And Chinese language has always informed that feeling of otherness or outsiderness for me and my interest in that feeling. My favorite Chinese expression <clears throat> is jing di zhi wa. This is the frog. Uh, jing di means at the bottom of the well and zhi wa is a frog. And the frog who's at the bottom of the well <laughs> looks up and predictably thinks that she can see the entire expanse of heaven, but in fact can of course only see a little circle. And I think like if you stay in your own language and relax into the kind of ruts of cliche or whatever is easiest for you, you never quite feel the full power of it. You have to learn someone else's language and then come back to your own language through that language. So that's kind of what my work does. And it's one of the reasons that often my students who do the most brilliant and beautiful work are non-native speakers and writers because they don't have access to cliche. They're essentially translating all the time or finding language in some new and, and exquisite way. Thank you for that absolutely fantastic exposition of being between and learning from that experience. Of course, as you were speaking, it also struck me as being slightly ironic that China has long had a middle kingdom mm -hmm. complex of its own. A sense that it is the center of the world. But it's marvelous when we transit from one sense of centered privilege to another and sort of destabilize ourselves. And uh, Rachel, if I may, I'm going to take the great liberty of reading a few lines from one of your poems from two menus, if I may. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is from Foreigners, and it goes like this. Beside me, tea has steeped all day, uncovered. I sip slow, Still it soaks my mouth with cold, leaves a faint taste I can't read. And this, this way in which you trans, transit not only between languages, but also between senses, is something that I find uh, uh, deeply resonant for me. Uh, there's a way in which your poetry and your fiction are both multi-sensory. They appeal to to, they appeal synesthetically as well, I find. So uh, I'm going to draw you out on something that may at first seem a little unrelated to questions of practice, but 
across your books, you tend to use the trope of affliction or a medical condition uh, to mark yeah. space of difference. There's uh, Emma Silver in Blind, who's gone, I'm not going to spoil this for readers, but there's a terrible fireworks accident, not coincidentally on Independence Day, uh, which renders her blind. Uh, Samantha Baxter in Banshee is fighting cancer. Naomi in Someday We Will Fly is suffering from malnourishment. And Judy in Big Girl Small is short for her age. She's 16 and three foot nine. So could I, could I ask you why these particular physical, visceral, medical conditions, I'm not going to say illness as metaphor, but why, why do you circle around to affliction as a ground for being different, being stigmatized, having a different yeah. perspective? Well, first of all, I mean, the line that pops into my mind is the line in one of your poems. I, I, think it's a, I think it's caution in the title. And the line is, this is the jolt where nerve end meets salt. Right. I feel like that's got, that's got a kind of like geographical synesthesia to it. And it's, it's the same. I mean, this is presumptuous for me to say. I don't know if it's the same, the same impulse or something. But there's some, first of all, I have just unbelievable synesthesia and I always have and I only learned that that was something weird I guess most people know that synesthesia is just when you're when the networks are crossed in your in your thinking or your your sensory experience of the world so that for me the days of the week always had colors and they were such a hard and fast rule that when I was in undergraduate school I was in a, co a poetry class with the very sarcastic and acerbic poet Kenneth Koch the New York poet and he was reading, an, I guess, an Apollinaire poem in which the days had colors. And I remember thinking Apollinaire was thwarting a cliche by using the wrong colors for the days. And when Kenneth Koch asked us, does anybody have colors for the days? I was absolutely dumbfounded and mortified. And I didn't raise my hand because only one other person in this lecture hall of 150 English students raised her hand. And I thought, oh, so that's a weirdness. Like I hadn't realized that that was something weird. But for me, there's never been an easy way um, to tease out those, those strands. And so I've capitalized on the fact that they're interwoven. Um, one of my favorite living poets is the poet Anne Carson a Canadian poet yeah. whose book Autobiography of Red is one of the most dazzling renditions or expressions of this kind of experience where the colors speak and sing and music looks like something and words have a taste and they float away and they break into pieces and everything is kind of this, it's, it almost feels kaleidoscopic to me when I'm in a good mood about it. When I'm in a bad mood about it, it becomes a kind of medical, a medical melting almost. It's like fear can liquefy me physically. And I mean, I bring this up now because I'm sometimes in a state of almost incapacitating fear. And for me, the, the, the way to cope with that is to make a structure. You know, you talk about this in your glorious essay about Louise Glick's poetry, right? The notion that like you can find a container for things, that form actually allows artists a way to, to tolerate completely intolerable circumstances. I mean, I should say in this moment that for the last seven months, I've written nothing but sonnets. And I think, I mean, I've thought, this is kind of odd for me. I, I'm almost always working on some fiction project because I like to live in my imagination. I like to create a world that's an alternate version of this one and, and operate there with characters I can manipulate in various ways. And all I want to do now is, is put this difficulty into a constraint that's knowable. Iambic pentameter feels like something comforting to me. It mimics the cadence of natural speech. Landing on a rhyme feels like certainty. So I'm always looking for a form. And sometimes that the, the form is the, is the physical human body in the novel. Some, so sometimes the form is kind of a poetic form, a genre question, a, a shape a project might take. And other times I put it in my characters. What I'm most interested in, in terms of their terrifying experiences is how, how we make manageable what's unmanageable. I think that's kind of what writing does, right? It gives you a way to quarantine your own worst terrors. I, for me, I mean, my students sometimes ask about their own lives, really. And this is such a serious and profound question. I love my students. You know, they're so brilliant. They're right always at the first 
train the first car in their trains of thought they're they're so present tense and they they're worried that to be a writer they have to have tormented terrible lives <laughs> and i'm so glad to be middle aged <laughs> because i feel like now i can tell them and be right that that you don't actually that writing allows you not to not to kind of i don't know i guess try out your worst impulses or ask about your worst fears in your daily life you can do it in your work and so a lot of the physical suffering in my work comes out of those kinds of fears it's like a way to exercise those demons or have build my own like catharsis wonderland or catharsis theme park or something and i'm scared of of, of physical damage damage to the body and i'm scared of difference and i'm also inspired by difference and i think it's the way that we articulate who we are in the context of each other and so it gives me a humongous amount of range to work with fantastic as it happens i mean thank you this is absolutely marvelous uh, as it happens i'm i'm synesthetic too as you may have guessed i'm not surprised <laughs> that doesn't surprise me so I've, I've always been fascinated by the condition been fascinated by the writing for instance of oliver sacks uh so yeah. these conditions really really appeal to me because they give you a different perspective like you said and it kind of anticipates the next question i had for you which was how do you how do you decide or what drives your choice as yeah. to whether to move in the direction of a poem or in the direction of fiction when you have some either biographical material you're dealing with or you're immersed in a particular uh, domain of research but you've you've sort of uh, responded to that already uh, in a way so let me let me move to another question which really i think emerges organically from uh, from your mentioning your students your professor of practice uh, which i think is a is is really a very special mandate uh, because there's no way to theorize these questions literary Liter the literary arts are, are, are practice, and I I was struck by by something you say about your your academic work when you say that, and I'm going to quote: "I teach all of my courses as both reading and writing classes." And further along, you talk of how you encourage your students not only to do their creative work proper, but also to do things like writing annotated bibliographies. and and i i tend to be uh, a mad fan of the bibliographic essay and i love yeah. writing footnotes it all seems pretty eccentric but but i i really reached out to this and i'm so struck by this idea that uh, you in an mfa context you also have to encourage people to read and to reach out to experiences not their own so could i ask you to expand on this and how does it play out in 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 actual practice in your negotiations with students the of course right well, you have to read well let me tie the two questions together because uh, so I, i teach my classes often with this idea of james baldwin's in the front of my mind this is from he it's from a paris review interview that he did in maybe 1980 from their art of fiction series and he's basically talking about the difference between preaching and writing right and he says something along the lines of to preach you have to kind of arrive at the pulpit already knowing something having reached a conclusion and you have to then convey that conclusion to your congregants and writing is the opposite in writing you're you're following something that you don't know and you're trying to figure out what it is even though often you don't even want to know what it is <laughs> you're sort of compelled to to examine a set of questions really and so i write by following my wonder I don't write what I know and I I I don't think that's possible or it's not it's not interesting I don't know how to do it and I don't know what I know I know a lot about what I don't know the older I got the more I know about how much I don't know and the shape my projects take depends on that wonder so someday we will fly for example this novel I just wrote which is a, a war novel set in 1940s Shanghai I wrote because I saw a photograph of some teenage boys in a refugee museum in Shanghai when i was there working on a contemporary television project and these boys are remarkable you know they look like sheepish and mischievous and adorable like teenage boys anywhere but they also have the like hollowed out desperate look of war orphans and it turns out they're jewish kids who fled 3000 miles across the sea and landed in japanese occupied shanghai in 1939 with their parents and they're wearing um table tennis t-shirts monogrammed insignia t-shirts and i stared at this photograph endlessly thinking like 
let me understand this. Their parents fled the Nazis, brought their kids to Shanghai, absolutely destitute, made a school for them, made a table tennis team, and then went to the trouble to make t-shirts. And for me, that the question was, oh my God, how? How do refugee populations possibly manage? And how do you make a childhood for your kid in a context as unnurturing as an occupied city at war? And that question required a novel. I felt like I had to go to Shanghai, which I did do for eight summers, and live in the buildings where Jewish refugees had been processed and examine the trees that they might have sat under and look through the museum's archives and so on. And just the pace of my thinking was a novelistic pace because of that question and the history surrounding it. And then sometimes I'll have a jolt of fear in the night that must be contained by a sonnet. And I make my students not only read and write, but also adapt their own work from one thing to another. So sometimes if my students are writing short fiction and I feel it, um, it isn't shaved down enough to be as propulsive as it could be, I ask students to adapt a page of it into a poem or a line of it into a poem. Or if they have a poem that doesn't feel fully realized, I ask them to try to make it into a short story version of itself so that they can feel the expanding and contracting of the containers. And obviously in order to do that well, they have to read beautiful books. And so I, I'm famous or infamous, I guess, for crushing my students under an avalanche of readings that I love. But I never want anybody to leave my classroom, no matter what I'm teaching, without reading tons of James Baldwin, tons of Gwendolyn Brooks, tons of Ann Carson. I teach, um, I teach Akhil Sharma's novel, Family Life, in almost every class. <clears throat> I have like a set of core books that I feel have made my writing possible. And I wanna give as wide a set of those possibilities to my students as I can, so they can figure out what work gives them guidance about the shapes of their own projects. Thank you. I particularly mm -hmm. respond to this idea of adapting uh, a text from one form to another. And I think we've, many of us have done it in our own practice. You, you see how, uh, a prose poem could then evolve into a fiction or it could be translated back into something else or be adapted for theater. Uh, it, it's, it's a marvelous form of, uh, of, uh, of really gaining literary muscle, if you will. And um, thank you also for dwelling on, on, on your research and your, and your empathetic reaching out to this particular history of Jewish refugees, refugees in Shanghai, because that's also part of our history in Bombay because this is the route that they took. Yeah, and many of them, you know, they got to Bombay and they really didn't want to move further. So they settled here and became part of Bombay's cultural life. They were among the early patrons of modern Indian art, for instance, some of them. So these are, these are incredible histories to retrieve. Uh, Rachel, I also wanted to ask you about uh, the sorts of labels, the genre labels that as authors, we sometimes have to work with. I find that some of your work is classified as young adult, so to speak. And uh, I've always been a little uh, anxious about that because growing up, we're the same generation roughly. Uh, I don't really remember these kinds of gradations. You, uh, especially if your parents just let you loose in, in, in the library, you read whatever came to hand. People were not that anxious about the reading age, what was appropriate and so on and so forth. And many of the 19th century classics were sort of children's classics by the time we got around to reading. But uh, I, want, I want you to speak, if you would, specifically to, to uh, uh, Big Girl Small, for instance. The yeah. themes are, I mean, they're not age bound. They're, if you will, universal. They speak to every age. And uh, I'm also thinking as someone who comes from a culture where uh, an author and a film director like Satyajit Rai wrote children's fiction and mm -hmm. people of any age can read it. So how do you approach this question of this particular kind of genre? Does it set constraints? Does it emancipate you in certain ways? Yeah. It's funny. It's really fun to meet you and hear you speak after, after reading your book. I keep thinking of... Um, I keep thinking of the line, uh, whatever you like, I've got a map that looks like it. <laughs> it's right. There's something in, in the syntax of your questions that's quite poetic and, and acrobatic and interesting. Um, you know, I, I love poetry. I found, I found reading your books so reassuring. 
Um, and you know, as for as for genre labels, I I think they're more really more of a marketing distinction mm -hmm. than a content distinction. And so I don't spend that much time fretting about them. Big Girl Small is kind of an interesting. It was an interesting introduction for me into the world of, of young adult literature and the question of what that means. I mean, I should say right now, I hope my parents are watching because they were, my parents were not paying attention to who was reading what in our house. And I read Lolita when I was 11, um, having a, I having a kind of festival in my parents' bookshelf. I was always in my, in my parents' bookshelf reading things that were, you know, I think not considered age appropriate. And I'm, I mean, maybe this is controversial, but I'm for that. I actually think, again, this relates to my idea of quarantining your own worst positions and impulses and fears in your work. I think it's a good way to experience difficult things when you're young, to kind of stretch your imagination, to have to reach. It's like standing on your tiptoes to catch a butterfly or to catch the gist of something that's difficult. It's work that matters and it gives you a template for later when you when you do come to understand those things. I mean, I'm not proposing that all 11 year olds read Lolita. That's obviously inappropriate. <laughs> but I don't really think that there are... Um, many content distinctions that that become laws around what what's why and what's not the only one that i can discern that's kind of reliable is that <clears throat> in young adult books the action is close in on the youth so the protagonist is a, is a kiddo who's doing the thing in that moment and once you get wisdom or distance or hindsight between the narrative voice and the kiddo, then it's not YA anymore. Right. And that's really the only distinction. So when I was selling uh, Big Girl Small, which is about, you know, a little person who gets involved in an absolutely appalling experience in her performing arts high school, I had interest from YA publishers and I, I didn't publish that book as a, as a young adult book. I published it as an adult novel, partly because I didn't know what YA meant. And I thought if it's a content distinction, I want no part of it. I, I thought maybe somebody would defang that book. And that's a book about the resilience of teenage girls in the face of extremely difficult circumstances. And for me, I thought if we took the teeth out of the thing that happens to this kid, the book wouldn't matter and it would become exploitative. So I published it as an adult novel and then the teenagers who read it anyway, of course, as teenagers do and will and as I did and would and you know still would if I were 11 or 13 or 16 now, the way they read that book when they came to my readings made me want to write my next book for them. So I made a decision to write Blind for the teenagers who had read Big Girl Small. And it's my only, Blind is my only, well, Blind and, and Someday We Will Fly are my only other books that can even be marketed that way. <laughs> Obviously, Banshee. Banshee is not a YA book. Um, but I, I think teenagers read with an unbelievably open mind and a passionate, willingness to connect intellectual dots and to, to say frankly what they're thinking and what they're feeling. And I think when adults read young adult fiction, we get for a minute the feeling of reading as a teenager, which is such a good feeling. I mean, I remember my mind being formed and, and reformed by books. I remember where I was sitting when I, I mean, I'm embarrassed even to use this example, but I remember where I was sitting when I read every single one of Judy Bloom's books. When I read Gone with the Wind, which was the example I was embarrassed of because it obviously doesn't hold up at all now. Um, but every book I read as a kid just branded my, my imagination. And so when I think about what's good in YA, I think about that. And I think about parents reading with their children. <clears throat> so these thoughts lead me to circle back to your teaching now, Rachel. Do you find that your students at university arrive not with this kind of diverse, crazy openness that teenagers have, but do they arrive with some kind of preconceptions about literary practice, what the literary life involves? So what is the kind of unlearning that you have to institute with your students? You know, my students at UChicago are so serious and they're so diligent. And I would say that they're, I, they, I don't have to unteach them, that they're so hungry to learn. And partly they're writers, you know, they're young writers and they've been reading since they were kids. And sometimes the reading lists they've been offered haven't been as inclusive and representative and complicated as I would have them be, which is what I'm here for. <laughs> like, I, I feel like part of my job is to bring as many kinds of books to them as I possibly can and to make sure that each of them again this is why you asked earlier about the bibliography assignment I asked them to make annotated bibliographies so that by the end of the quarter they have thought deeply about what it would mean to make a syllabus for other readers 
and what's made their their mind the way it looks now and how to kind of how to widen your own perspective how to get out of the well you know if you have the jingdi jirwa the frog in the well problem in your reading life actually you can fix that quite easily um so i i you know i don't find my students uh I don't find them self-righteous. I don't find them pedantic. I don't really find them narrow in any way. They're, they have a real consciousness about the world and about the fact that their, their particular lives matter in the sense that they need to be active and, and moral and ethical agents of beautiful work, but not in, in the sense that they're entitled or narcissistic. Now that's hugely inspiring to hear. Also to think about uh, syllabus as one of the ways in which uh, we can help re reframe and remake the world. Rachel, you still there? I thought the image for I'm here. Ah, you're here. Fabulous. Great. Yeah. No, I was just saying that it's 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 marvelous to think about something like a syllabus or a curriculum, and to use that as a platform with which to remake and reframe a world that very powerful forces want to narrow down. So. So this is, this right. is really this is really wonderful. Do you find that your students, I'm sorry to put your students on the spot remotely like this, but do, do you find that there is a great curiosity about the literatures of other, of other societies, other periods? Or Absolutely. is that something? No, I definitely do. And where there isn't, it's because it's never been suggested. I mean, my students are, you know, they're, they're still kind of children, <laughs> like they're in their, tw their early 20s, or some of them are, you know, 19, 18. And I've had kids in my office, you know, read uh, Akhil Sharma, or read James Baldwin, or read this Chinese writer I admire, uh, Xiao Lu Guo, her book, A Concise Chinese English Dictionary for Lovers, is one of my favorites to teach, or read Claudia Rankin, and feel like I never, I never thought of it that way. You know, when I teach Claudia Rankin Citizen, I watch my students have epiphanies. And, and when I teach international literature, I teach a lot of Chinese writers, um, partly because I, I worry that my students won't otherwise have access to those writers' works. Um, I realize that my students have the capacity to imagine huge perspectives and to engage in all kinds of global conversations, but sometimes they need a little bit of guidance. Um, and I, I, again, I, I just wanna reiterate that like my preferred method of, of guiding is through questions, not through answers. I wanna like allow them to ask questions. And also I think it's important in this moment to say that for young writers, risk is an essential component of making meaningful work. They have to be able to take risks. And I mean, real risks, emotional risks, artistic risks, and they have to be okay if they get it wrong. Like, I don't wanna cancel the work of young people. I don't believe in canceling books. I don't believe in banning books. I don't believe in burning books. You know, I think like when, when kids are writing, we have to let them make the work and then distill it. And part of what happens in a really good workshop is you can kind of reflect light back on students and say, hey, you know, here's what I saw in what you wrote. Is that what you thought you were asking? Is that what you thought you were saying? And sometimes the answer is yes. And sometimes the answer is, oh, my God, is that what's in there? I didn't realize. And then you go back and you revise. And that way you teach students to revise and you create kind of little populations in your mind who help you revise in advance so that you don't make the same mistakes over and over in your own work. It's fantastic. Also speaks to the inexhaustibility of the text, but also of reading. And uh, Rachel, I'm going to pull a complete surprise on you here. We didn't discuss this before, but do you think I could ask you to read Cardiac Breakfast? Sure. You, you don't have it open to that page, do you? I don't have this uh, copy <laughs> marked. Let me see if I can find that poem. I'm just going to. I got it. All right. it. Fabulous. <clears throat> Cardiac Breakfast. After Beijing, there's just time. U.S. days parade by military in green, helicopters, chickens, and dictionaries. See my English in lines I'm in between. After Beijing, sweet disorder takes over. Here language unfolds in a stroke overnight. February arrives. Inevitable surprise. I discover myself upside down, out inside, under, ripe. So let's eat America together. Take this icy time zone. Watch the weather get married, play pool. Let's make a deal. 
seal culture shocked kisses, speak English forever. Sound cool? After Beijing, I wake up starfish points, parched with salt, tasting lime from the water flown over. Anoint, set me free, teach my language to speak me. I'm home and this alphabet's mine. Thank you. Anoint, set me free, teach my language to speak me is just beautiful. And I thank think you. This, uh, thank you for reading the poem and sharing it. Uh, Rachel, I think we now have questions from the audience and uh, if I could maybe relay them to you. Of course. Uh, Mit Mitva asks, Rachel, you're a multifaceted writer having written everything from poetry and short stories to novels, memoirs, and even scripts for shows. Do you have any specific techniques to master all of these vastly different styles? Is there anything in your process that stays consistent across them through most of them? Thank you for the question. So my, my, main, my main skill is reading other people's beautiful work and imagining what I might make and how I might best make it. And in terms of my process and what stays consistent, I'm, a, I'm a, an inspired writer and then a reviser. So I make big, unwieldy, awful drafts. And then I ride the inspiration for as far and as many pages of, as it will take me. And then when I run out of inspiration, I go back and I start reading it. And I revise and revise and revise and revise. And sometimes I start with a story. And then by the time I've revised it until it's its best possible version, it's actually a poem. It turns out I only needed a few, a few words to say the thing I was trying to say or to ask the thing I was trying to ask. But mainly I, I sit at my desk and I work. And when I can't work, I read. And when I can work, I read. I'm always reading other people's work and I'm always thinking about other people's language. I would say that my other piece of just kind of big advice, which it doesn't have that much to do with the shape of things, but is to memorize poems. Memorize some poems that you love and then they become part of your marrow and they actually change your own meter, the metrical precision of your own work. So when things are going very badly for me, writing wise, I memorize a poem and then I have something. It's like a, like a worry stone in my pocket or something and I can go back to my projects and, and keep working on them. And I'll say one final thing about this, which is that actually I have found that screenwriting, which is really more my husband's domain than mine, reminds me of poetry. It's really an act of great distillation where all of the, the luxurious mass of prose has to be cut away and you are left only with kind of what people said and the suggestion underneath it of what they meant to say or what they <laughs> passive aggressively actually said and their actions and that's it. So if you can kind of draw constellations between the different sorts of projects for yourself, I think that can be useful in terms of using skills you've already built when you try something new. Rachel, this sort of segues into the next question from Shubankar Bhattacharya, which is, can reading widely and deeply and imaginatively alone hone an aspiring writer's imagination? Definitely. Definitely. You mean, I think you mean, like, can you, can you do it without formal study? Absolutely, yes. I think many people read and read and read and read, and then they write their work based on what they've read and how they've thought of it. What formal study offers you mostly, I think, is time and seriousness and a community of like-minded people who are willing to talk about books with you. And those things are beautiful and meaningful, but they're also a luxury. So can you become a writer without them? With adequate, diligent reading, I would say yes. And I think we have time for just one final question, which is from Kamini Iyer, who asks, if you had a book club, what would it be reading? I consider my class a book club. <laughs> and we're reading uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain by James Baldwin. And we're reading Citizen uh, by Claudia Rankin. Oh, lovely. Fantastic. Rachel, it's been a real delight to, to have this conversation with you, to hear your insights and your experiences which you've shared with such generosity so thank you very much indeed and thank I'm you so much it was a delight for me as well thank you really really nice to know you likewise really and i'm now going to ask sanjoy to come back in and uh, conclude the session thank you so much ranjit haskoti and rachel that was such a beautiful session i i could have certainly carried on listening to this for at least another hour. 
uh, with both of you playing off each other through literature and words and poetry. Absolutely fascinating. And for those of you who are wondering, what is that image that's coming through? I, I was on Facebook trying to see how Rachel's image was looking. And uh, that is the lake in Chicago, and that's the Field Museum. I know it appears as a little bit uh, on the Facebook uh, window if you're watching it from your phone, uh, but it is and on a cold a winter day, sometimes the lake freezes over and the edge of the lake is all icy. Uh, so thank you both. Uh, that was really, truly beautiful. And I hope we can get both of you back on uh, the show in the future. And Rachel, uh, for you to come to the Jeffrey Richard Festival, when and if and, you know, uh, a post COVID era, and I don't know whether it's right to say post presidential present era of PPP. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. All of those things. <laughs> <laughs> but whichever one it may be, uh, we look forward to receiving you here. Uh, you Thank haven't you. been. We really love to have you uh, read in person in flesh and blood. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you both. We're also very grateful to Professor Dipesh Chakravarti, the faculty director, and Aditi Modi, the executive director of U Chicago Center in Delhi for their partnership. Thank you very much for watching. And I do hope you will be logged back on at 8.30 p.m. for our next session on JLF's Brave New World, Muscular India, Masculinity, Mobility, and the New Middle Class. We are Michelle Bass in conversation with Vivek Tejuja. Unraveling a world hidden in plain sight, Michelle Bass's mus Muscular India, Masculinity, Mobility, and the New Middle Class introduces us to the inner workings of the gyms of a new India the new powerhouse. Bass discusses the intricacies of the use of bodily capital to escape class barriers and the contradictions within a space that has taken India by storm. And that is at 8.30 p.m., so do log on. And finally, we have another uh, showing of I Believe Art Matters. As you know, 450 artists have come together as part of an advocacy and fundraising program I Believe Art Matters, uh, which we began three weeks ago, and this is to raise resources for 5,200 families, artists, and artisans who have really been devastated. If there's one sector across the world that's been affected by the pandemic, it is uh, the cultural sector with everything having been shut down. So please do tune in. This is on uh, the television channel, India Ahead, and this will be on this evening, it's on, on Saturday and Sunday. It's a six and a half hour marathon screening, which has been broken up into lovely manageable bits over these three next days. So enjoy the watching. Remember that's on India Ahead. Uh, it's the television channel. You can also catch them on their digital channel. Uh, so do watch that starting today. Thank you and see you at 8.30 p.m.